You will this morning turn in your Bibles to 1 John chapter 5. 1 John chapter 5, we'll begin reading with verse 1 and read through verse 3. 1 John chapter 5, verses 1 through 3. Whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And everyone who loves Him who begot also loves Him who is begotten of Him. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep His commandments. For this is the love of God that we keep His commandments. And His commandments are not burdensome. So John continues on here with the theme as he ended chapter 4 and as he really in these first three verses here continues in chapter 5 continues on with the theme of the agape love which is manifested in the lives of the children of God. Agape love is something that only the children of God possess. And John describes the nature of that love and the characteristics of that love here in this book of 1 John and really in many places in John, the Gospel of John, we talk about this, that this is a recurring theme in his writings. And uh, perhaps because you remember that John referred to himself as the apostle who Jesus loved. And so, Whatever the reason why that John described himself in such a way, I do not know, but he definitely had a great appreciation for the love of God for him. And so what John talks about in 1 John, and as we ended chapter 4 and going to chapter 5, it is this love of God is a demonstrated love. It is a love which we could say of tests or proofs. There are proofs of our love for God or possessing the love of God or loving the children of God. And he has spoken of this in various places in this book and he continues to speak about this in these first three verses here of 1 John. Ah, and his first statement here, whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. When he makes this statement here, now many might would say and take that, oh, I believe that Jesus is the Christ, is, uh, that he's the Christ. But John's statement here is more than to just make a mere statement. Men may make mere statements of truth that really do not resonate as truth in their hearts. This is more than a mental assent. This is more than an oral affirmation, we would say, an oral affirmation of Christ. Now the word for believes here in the original language in the Greek is the word pestuo. It is the same word that is used for faith that we find many times throughout the New Testament writings. And the word that is used here in the tense, it is in what we would call in the Greek the present participle, which expresses a continuous or a repeated action. In other words, this is an ongoing supernatural faith. It is the faith that is spoken of, I believe, in Ephesians 2 and 8. that says, for by grace that you say through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. This supernatural faith is a gift of God. It is not uh, produced by human er effort. It is not something that you are born with. There are some that think, well, the faith that you need to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you're born with. You are not born with that. If we believe what we believe about the sovereignty of God and salvation, we understand, if we accept the Scriptures, we understand that this is a supernatural gift of God, this faith. is given, I believe, by the quickening of the Holy Spirit. I mean, Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 26, when it talks about the fruit of the Spirit there, the first one is love that he talks a lot about, but one of those that listed in there is faith. It is a product of the Holy Spirit. 
And so whoever believes, as he says here, whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ, evidence as he says that they have been born of God. If we believe that faith and belief in Christ as the anointed one, and this is what he's talking about here, Jesus is the anointed one, he is the anointed of God, we believe that, and we believe that that is a supernatural thing, then we know that those that believe that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. He is born of above. It is the same phrase, it's the same word in the, the Greek that, that Jesus uses in his conversation with Nicodemus in John 3. In John 3 and 3, he says, Most assuredly, Jesus speaking to Nicodemus says, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Same word that is used there. In verse 5, Jesus answered, Most assuredly, or truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the Spirit is spirit. So this being born of the Spirit, I believe he's talking about there this faith that is given, this regenerating regeneration that we receive, part of that is the faith to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. The people talk about accepting the Lord. So we need to be accepted of Him. People talk about, well, you know, I was looking for Jesus. No, you weren't looking for Jesus, not until the Holy Spirit did a work in your life and you believed in Jesus. We might not have understood all there was to believe about it, but we believe in Him by this faith that is given by the Holy Spirit. And this is an evidence of being born of God, regenerated of God. So therefore, the core belief of those who have faith is that Jesus is the Christ. He is the Anointed One sent from God the Father. That He is the Messiah. He is who He said He was. As I was studying this, I thought of, of over there in Matthew chapter 16, and, and Jesus asked a question of the apostles. He, he said, some say, you know, he asked, well, who do men say that I am? He said, some say you're John the Baptist, and some Elijah, and others Jeremiah, one of the prophets, and I've quoted this before in reference to other sections of 1 John, but he asked a question, Jesus asked a question, who do you say that I am? And Jesus sounded Peter answered and said, you are the Christ. You are the anointed one. You are the Son of the living God. And what did Jesus say to him? Well, good for you, Peter. Good for you. You're smarter than these other guys. You're even more intellectual than these other guys. You're more learned than these other guys. No. He said, blessed are you, Simon. Simon Barjona. We could say Simon Johnson if we used that time. <laughs> for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. You see, that is, a, that is a revealed truth. That is the eyes of the blind being opened and seeing Christ for who He truly is. We will be coming up soon on the Christmas season and many people will talk about Jesus. Oh yes, yes, I know who Jesus is. But they don't really know Him. They don't really have never seen him as the Messiah. They've never really seen him as the anointed one of God the Father. Their eyes have not been opened to that. And how does that come? Well, as Jesus said to Simon, he, I mean, he said, and this is revealed to you. This has been revealed by my, by, by my Father who is in heaven. And also in another place in John chapter 1 and verses 12 and 13, John wrote this, that as many have received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name who were born not of blood, nor the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. They are born again of God. They are born of Him, born of the Spirit. And when they're born of the Spirit, they have faith to believe that Jesus is the Christ. They give evidence of that. <laughs> and then he says that everyone who loves Him and be God also loves Him who is begotten of Him. John states here again that the evidence of our loving God is that we love the children of God. There is a fellowship.
relationship that we have. There is a common love that we have with the children of God that evidences that we've been born of God. For someone to say that I love God but they have nothing to do with the children of God, there's a contradiction there. At least according to John the Apostle. The Word of God states that if someone loves God, he's going to love the people of God. He's going to want to be with the people of God. I came across a scripture in my studies in 1 Corinthians 1 and 9 where Paul wrote, God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of His Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And that word fellowship there is that word koinonia, a commonness. There is a common bond that we have there. There is a common love that we have for God and for His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And that common love and that, that koinonia draws us into fellowship one with another. Because if you go over to Acts chapter 2 there in the early church and there in verse 42 after the day of Pentecost came and the 3,000 were saved and you go there to verse 42 it says they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, koinonia. They had this commonality of love and they wanted to be with, with one another all the time. I mean, if you look there, then look there in Acts chapter two and three and four, it looked like they were just just hanging out together all the time. Now, wouldn't that be great? You get to stay with the people of God all the time. I mean, you know, we come up here on on Sundays and we and Wednesdays and we stay and we stay and after the church service is over, we stay and we stay and we stay. And we stay. And sometimes I just have to turn the lights off and get them to leave. <laughs> because I have to, pastor has to sleep sometimes. But, but you understand, we would love to do that. We can't because we have to, to, to work out in the world and support our family. But you see there, there's a love. There is a desire. There is a bond there. There is this deep bond of love there for one another. And that's an evidence of our love for God and that we have been born of God. And the one who loves Him, the one who loves God the Father, His Son, Jesus Christ, He also loves, the, he also loves Him who has been begotten by Him, who has been born of the Spirit of God. I also came across in my studies or thought of this in, in Philippians chapter 2. There in verses 1 through 4. And Paul here is, is teaching about this love there. And he says in the first four verses, Therefore, if there is any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship, koinonia of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind, let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interest, but also for the interest of others. This is how this love is fleshed out. There's this oneness of mind. There is this unity. There is this always esteeming others as better than themselves. There is not the seeking of our own agenda, but the, we are seeking the welfare of others because we have the love of God shed abroad in our hearts and we have this koinonia and this common love for one another. So as John writes this, that whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God and everyone who loves Him, who the God also loves Him who is begotten of Him, this is what that love looks like. And that's what that love, how that love is to look within the local body of Christ. Then in verse 2, John says, by this we know, we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep His commandments. Another evidence of our salvation is seen in our obedience to the commandments of God. Now some people think, well, the commandments, that was just for the Old Testament. And say, well, oh, I, I, I can do that. There's only ten of them. Mm -hmm. uh, you need to get out your calculator and recount and go through your concordance and count the commandments. But then you need to add in the New Testament. Because 
the commandments of Christ in the New Testament are magnified. They, they are added to. I, I, I hate to tell you this, but the commandments are added to. Now, they're of a different nature, but they are many commandments in the New Testament. But you see, this is an evidence that we as the children of God love God and love the children of God because we love God and keep His commandments. And I believe this, that if we truly love God, if we truly love His people, if we love one another, we will be obedient to His Word. The best place that I can go to to talk about a delight for and a love for the Word of God and the commandments of God is in the Psalms. I love, as I've said many times, Psalm 1, and I've, I've, I've used that already in this, in this teaching of 1 John, but we can't go to it too often, I think. The psalmist David said in Psalm 1, in the first two verses, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly. He doesn't stand in the path of sinners. He doesn't sit in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. The man of God, the child of God, has a delight for the law of God. I believe this, that the Spirit of God given to us gives us a delight for His Word. There's nothing else that will satisfy us on this earth like the Word of God will and the truth of the Word of God. Amen. He delights in it. He delights in it so much that He's like the, the tree planted by a stream or by a river and He's continually given moisture in the roots and He continually bears fruit. Amen. Those people that bear fruit for the Lord Jesus Christ are those who are continually delighting in the Word of God and the law of God. And then of course we cannot speak of this delight in the in the in God's Word and the commandments without going to the 119th Psalm. Now on Wednesday nights, we're in the process of reading through the 119th Psalm. In verse 10 of Psalm 119, David wrote this. He said, With my whole heart I have sought you. Oh, let me not wander from your commandments. He's not saying, oh, these things are a burden to me. Oh, I just wish I could get away from these commandments. He says, no, my whole heart has sought you. Oh, don't let me wander from your commandments. We're going to have to verse 33. Really, this, most of this section here, this section of eight verses, David says, teach me, O Lord, the way of your statutes. I shall keep it to the end. Give me understanding and I shall... Keep your law. Indeed, I shall observe it with my whole heart. Make me walk in the path of your commandments. For I delight in it. Incline my heart to your testimonies, not to covetousness. Turn away my eyes from looking at worthless things. Revive me in your way. Establish your word to your servant who is devoted to fearing you. Turn away my reproach, which I dread, for your judgments are good. Behold, I long for your precepts. Revive me in your righteousness. Inside the 127th verse, he says, Therefore I love your commandments more than gold, yes, than fine gold. In verse 143, he says, Trouble and anguish have overtaken me, yet your commandments are my delights. The commandments of God are to be our delight. We delight in it because it's God's Word. It's food for our souls. It's that which rejoices our heart and our minds. But then we move to the New Testament. We read the Scripture this morning in John 14. When Jesus spoke of commandment and commandments, and there's a correlation there between the love of God's people and the love of, of God's people 
people for Christ. If you love me, keep my commandments, he said in verse 15. In verse 21, he who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me. We keep his commandments if we do what Jesus said. It's an indication that we love Christ. That we love his people. John 15, verse 9. As the Father loved me, I also Lord, have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. Just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in His love. In verse 12, this is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. There are those commandments that Christ has given and He said, an indication of your love for me, do you love my commandments? Do you perform my commandments? Are you obedient to my commandments? Keeping of commandments is, is tied to a love for God and a love of His Word. And we cannot say that we love God and live in disobedience to those commands in His Word. We cannot say, oh, well, I have liberty now apart from the law of God. And yes, we are free from the, the judgment of the law of God. But the child of God, the Word of God now is imprinted upon His heart and in His heart and it flows throughout His soul. He loves that. You cannot say that we love God and live in disobedience to those commands in His Word. I mean, I think about, you know, what are some say, well, Pastor, what are some other commandments besides these? That we, we talk here about the delight, but you mean there's commandments in, in, in the New Testament? Amen. Oh, yes. Remember the story in Matthew chapter 22. And there in Matthew chapter 22, the Pharisees and the Sadducees are trying to trick Jesus. You look up in there in verse 35 of Matthew 22, it says, One of them, a lawyer, asked him a question, testing him. How foolish. You're going to test the author of Scripture? Okay. They didn't accept that. But one of them said, a lawyer asking him a question, testing him and saying, you know, I could really make a lawyer joke there, but uh, that would take away from the teaching here. Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. And this is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. And I believe that we are still to do that. We are still commanded to do that, are we not, as Christians? Even maybe more so now that we have the Spirit of God, we are, have that ability now to love the Lord. Just think about that. You, by the power of the Spirit of God, He has commanded us and we have that ability to love the Lord our God with all of our heart and with all of our soul and with all of our mind. We are striving to do that. Shall we ever do that perfectly here on earth? No, but we, we, have, we have that desire, I believe, in the heart of the believer. And then he said, you love your neighbor as yourself. We're to love others in this way with the kind of love that God has loved toward others. But you see, this does not just apply here to the gospel, any commands. It also applies to other commands that we find in the Scripture. I came across, as I was cross-referencing through my concordance, I came across this scripture in 1 Corinthians 14 and 37 where Paul writes, If anyone thinks himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things which I write to you are the commandments of the Lord. Do you get that? The things that I write to you as the Apostle Paul are the commandments of the Lord. It's not just the Ten Commandments. It's not just the Pentateuch. It's not... Even just the words of Jesus. He says, these things that I write to you, I've gotten these from God Himself. As I write Scripture, these are the commandments of the Lord. You are to be obedient to them. You want to know what a few of those are? I've written them down for you. If you want to just listen to these, you can. Romans 12 and 2. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed 
by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Now, take my word for it. All of these in the Greek aren't the imperative. They are commands. That's a command. In Romans 13 and 1, another one. Let every soul be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. You mean, Brother Weber, even if those authorities are ungodly, we're to be, we're to be obedient to them? Yes, God has established them. Now, fortunately, in our culture, if we believe a man to be ungodly, we have the opportunity as Christians to vote him out. But as long as they're in office, God says you be obedient to them. In Ephesians chapter 4, Brother Wayne will be quite familiar with this. In chapter 4, beginning with about verse 25, and really all the way down to the first part of chapter 6, there is command after command after command after command. They are not requests. These are not something that you're to do just to experience the higher Christian life. Paul, these, these are commands. Look at some of them. Therefore, putting away lying, let each one of you speak truth with his neighbor. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down in your wrath. Do not give place to the devil. Let him who stole steal no more. And let him work. Let him work with his hands. Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth. What is good for edification? Do not grieve. The Holy Spirit of God. By the way, that's a command. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ would guide you. Guess what, folks? Those are all commands. Those are all commands. Down to chapter 5. And we can go all through here to chapter 5. Therefore, be imitators of God as dear children. Command. But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness not to even be named among you. Command. Oh, here's some good ones. Down here in chapter 5, verse 22. Well, verse 18. Let's get to that one first. Verse 18. He says here, Do not be drunk with wine in which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. Command. Verse 22. Wives. Submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. Command. But man, you don't get off the hook. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. Command. Chapter 6, verse 4. You fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath and bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Command. Verse 5, bond servants, be obedient to those who are your masters. Command. Verse 9, you masters, do the same things to them, giving up threatening, knowing that your own master also is in heaven, that there is no partiality with him. Command. Do you get that? A whole lot more than 10 there. A whole lot more. On another one over there, in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25, command, do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together as a manner of something. See, those that love God evidence this by keeping the commandments of God. And earlier in 1 John in chapter 2, and there in verses 3 through 5, John the 4 wrote this, Now by this we know that we know Him what? If we keep His commandments. He who says, I know Him and does not keep His commandments, is a what? L-I-A-R liar. And the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word truly, the love of God is perfected in him. By this we know that we are in him. He who says he abides in him ought himself also to walk just as he walks. So the evidence that we love the children of God we love God Himself is the fact that we keep His commandments. And then the last verse in out of these three verses, for this is the love of God that we keep His commandments 
and his commandments are not burdensome or grievous. The evidence, or an evidence that we love God is that we keep the commandments of God and they are not a burden. Have you ever heard somebody say, well, if I become a Christian, I, I'm just, it's just going to be such a burden. I don't get to do all those kind of things that I used to love to do. I don't get to uh, party and get drunk and, and do all of these things and sleep in on Sunday morning and, and I've got to read my Bible and I've got to hang out with all you Christian people. And oh, that just sounds like a drag. Well, guess what? You get changed by the Spirit of God if you are born of God. He changes all those want-tos. He changes all those desires. He changes all those delights. He changes those things that you love. Those things that you used to love don't mean a thing anymore. It's about God and His Word and His people. We, we love God. We keep the commandments of God. They are not a burden. They are a delight. They are a joy to our soul. Think about over there, in, I believe it is in Romans 7 and 22, and, and, and Paul is talking about that warfare in him with the, the old man, the inner man, but he still says in the midst of that in 7 and 22, I delight in the law of God according to the inward man. I'm still buffeted in this body of flesh. He says, who's going to deliver me from this body of death? But in the inward man, I delight in the law of God. I delight in the Word of God. I delight in the commandments of God. They are my joy. They are my delight. They are not a burden to me. They are a joy to me. We do not loathe them. We do not disdain them, but we love them. We read them in God's Word. Our hearts and our souls are warm. As we are obedient to them, we are changed. We are being conformed to the image of Christ. Now, those outside of Christ, they don't have that love. They don't have that desire for the commands. They are a burden. As I've said, they are an offense to them. You remember back in, in the Gospels, the Lord talked about over in, in Matthew 23 when He was talking about when He was dressing down the Pharisees. He said, you substituted for the commandments of God the commandments of men and you burdened the people down. And they felt the burden. But we as the children of God, Jesus has said to us, come to Me for My yoke is light. My burden is easy. Yes, we carry. We, we are obedient to the Word of God and those things are not a weight to us. They are a delight to us. They are our joy. They are what we desire. They are, as we said, we, we desire that more than our necessary food. Have you ever been so delighted in the truth of God and the Word of God sometimes that you forget about eating? It doesn't happen often enough for me. I know. But we ought to be so delighted in the Word of God. We ought to be so filled with the Word of God sometimes that, that we forget to eat. God give us more of a desire, more of a joy, more delight in His Word. To not be so concerned about the worldly things and those, those other things that are temporary delights that are here today and gone tomorrow. But may we as the children of God delight and joy in that which is eternal, the eternal food of God that He gives to our souls, that He gives us a desire for it. May we pray. Heavenly Father, I do thank you today that you've given us a hunger and a desire and a delight in the Word of God. Father, I thank you for, for your Word this morning. I thank you for the Word of God that we've read. I thank you for the Word of God which Brother Wayne talked to us this morning. I, I thank you for the Word of God that you've allowed us to partake of today. 
Father, may daily, not just on this day, not just on this what we call the Lord's Day, but may daily we delight in Your Word. May they be our joy. May they be what we take into our soul. Father, I do thank You for those that are here today. I thank You, Father, for the providence of God in bringing them to this place. And I do pray, Father, that as we believe that Your Word does not return into You void, we pray that Your Word that has gone out today will accomplish the work that You have designed it to, that You have purposed it to, in the hearts of those here today. In Your holy name we pray.